Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Matt Horn is not available. At the tone, please record your message. When you have finished recording, you may hang up or press 1 for more options. Angie, I remember now. The winner of the year was Hesperia Gales. No idle talk. You'll crash, Dingo. In the final 30 seconds, Henry G trashed out from field out. Man, we had a great time that night. 20 to touchdown. Can't wait for the new season. Good morning. Ready for combat operation. This is orbital frame Jehuti. Do you want me to explain how to manipulate the frame? Hi, Matt. This is Remy LaBeouf. I was just uh, calling to uh, talk about Zone of the Enders. I guess I'll uh, try uh, calling you again later. Thanks. On the line, we have Remy LaBeouf talking to us from... Where are you talking to us from, Remy? I'm in uh, Brooklyn, New York. Oh, oh, I do like New York. <laughs> yeah, it's a great place. You're not a New Yorker, though, are you, if I remember? Becoming a New Yorker kind of happens upon you after you live here long enough. I'm originally from Santa Cruz, California. Sort of can sense with your name, there's a sort of French connection. My dad is Cajun, he's from Louisiana, so uh, there's, there's a lot of French roots down there. And I guess you can trace my ancestry back through Canada into France a couple hundred years ago. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to shock and awe everybody who's listening to this podcast now. Go ahead. Mm. (laughs) The reason why I've got you here, I don't believe it quite myself, is because of the fact that they're re-releasing Zone of the Enders, the second runner, on PlayStation 4. (laughs) Yes, exactly. The funny thing is, is the fact that this is a game that was released 15 years ago, in 2003, and the fact that you yourself were in the original one, which is 2001. I guess it was too thick. Yeah, something like that. Mm. This is going to be a tricky one, Remy. What do you remember most about the production of the game? Oh, uh, like the experience of recording the the voice? Yeah. I remember going to a studio. I was 15 years old, and uh, I was really excited about it. I did the voiceover along with the character Ada, and the two of us were in the room together because we responded a lot in the game, so... That was really fun. She was a really nice woman. I, I haven't kept in touch with her, but um, that was my experience. And I remember um, I couldn't drive at the time, so my, my mom dropped me off, and I worked there for several hours, uh, for several days, and um, it was a really fun experience to have as a kid. You play Leo, if I remember. Mm-hmm. Obviously, Leo has since aged and become yourself, Remy. Yep, that's right. <laughs> I can't hear any sort of Leo in, in your voice now. It's sort of very well, peculiar. A lot of the voiceover I did for Leo was, uh, well, I, I was screaming. And so when I'm screaming, my voice gets tighter and then it gets higher. So if, if I'm talking like this about something, then my voice gets, you know, it gets it gets a little higher. So that sounds probably more like the character. <laughs> the interesting thing is, is obviously I played the demo of the re-release. Okay. Oh, okay. Mm. Mm-hmm. And interestingly enough, obviously, it's exactly how it would be if you remastered a 15-year-old game into... You know, 4K and HD visuals, it's obviously very improved. But the interesting thing, I think, on this is the fact that they've now done, I can't believe this, a VR mode. Oh, wow. Yeah. So basically, you flip on the goggles and then you're in the actual thing like you were in the first game and you basically play as if you're in the machine. Is that to you just sort of peculiar? It makes it seem kind of like a different game, I suppose. But uh, to be honest, you might be disappointed by this. I haven't actually played the game much, so. <laughs> so what you're, what you're saying, Remy, I can't believe this. I think we're getting exclusive here. Is that you've done these two games, obviously, but you've never played the actual. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have the system at the time. And I think by that time, I started focusing on music a lot more in my life, you know. But I'd still love to play the game. But I've seen a lot of the videos on, on YouTube, just out of curiosity, just seeing people playing it and, and kind of going back in time. Do you get people who are fans of the game coming to you? Occasionally, somebody will 
start talking about video game stuff, and I'll mention that I, I used to do voiceovers, and uh, uh, every once in a while someone's like, oh, whoa, I played that game. <laughs> but I, I think it happened more, more often in the early 2000s after the game was released. I remember getting calls from some friends who, who had just like finished the game and saw the credits, and they were like, what? That was you? <laughs> so that's funny. Now, I'm going to play something a bit dangerous now, Remy. Okay. Part of me was obviously intrigued that they remastered it in the first place. I was a bit shocked that they didn't include the first game, which doesn't quite make sense to me, even now. Mm. You'd think, you know, if you're going to release the second one, as a, you know, re-release them, why are you not, you know, go for the first one? I'm sort of interested now to see whether the reason why they're re-releasing the second one is that they have an intention to do potentially a third one. That would be pretty exciting. Because obviously they're going to have to use the old cast, but then obviously you being a kid in the first and second one, now if they did it you know, 15 years later, it would make sense that the character was adult, wouldn't it? I don't know what kind of timeline they're on, if they want the characters to age or if they would kind of pick up where they left off, but... I would love to hear from them and get back into that world. If I remember correctly, the, the second run or the, the sequel to the first game, I don't believe I played as big a role in that game, but I, I would hope that if they released the third game, I'd be involved. Mm, mm. It, was, it was a lot of fun. Mm. Could you see it being turned into a film, maybe? Of course, yeah, sure. Yeah, that would be cool. I've been talking to a few of the cast, obviously, because of the re-release, and the idea is sort of a bit Top Gunny. They make movies out of all kinds of things these days. I mean, they might as well. It's as good a thing to make a movie out of as anything else. Mm, mm. Who do you think would play you? Well, you, you. <laughs> Who would play me? Oh, I don't know. I mean, it would probably be like a kid. I'm not super familiar with uh, 15-year-old actors at this point, but uh, I don't know. I'm going to throw one out there. Jacob Tremblay. Who's that? Did you see the film Room? No. No, it's the one where they, they got locked in a in a basement with this other chap. He wouldn't let them out. Oh, well, okay. Well, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> to go from one industry to the other, I suppose, people will be instantly uh, astonished, I suppose, to um, find out that you are an accomplished jazz pianist or saxophonist. That's right, yeah, saxophonist. I've got an identical twin brother, and he's he's a pianist. But yeah, that's that's uh, mostly what I do now. Mm. What would you say that that your influences are as a as a jazz musician? I, I think uh, the more direct answer would probably be maybe Charles Mingus, Aaron Copeland, Kurt Rosenwinkel. Of course, there are some some incredible saxophonists like uh, like uh, John Coltrane. I think music and conversation are very similar in the way that we engage each other as improvisers on stage or the way that we engage each other in conversation. I think that's actually a big influence. Just the people I communicate with and um, non-musical things are a big influence on me. I mean, obviously, I've seen jazz musicians on stage. Mm -hmm. And what confuses me a lot about jazz, I do like jazz. I just, I just sort of can't see in my head how it works, if that makes sense. Oh, jazz is a tradition. People do a lot of different things with that tradition. So, you know, some jazz, I think people feel like they don't understand it, but there isn't so much to be understood. If you enjoy it, you enjoy it. I think it's it's very similar to, to a language. And if you are, are surrounded by a language, you, you learn to speak that language more, you know. So the more familiar you get with it, you, you recognize more patterns in the way that people interact with each other. It's kind of like if you take the, the, the speech that I, that I have right now, I've got the ups and downs of my voice. Get really soft, and then I can get really loud, and I can speed up, and I can do all these things. Like that's that's very musical. And I think if you just take away the the symbols and the the words and all these things, and you just have the the shapes of of the voice, I think that's a lot of what people use when they play music. And I think in in the case of jazz, people are are kind of working with those uh, patterns and those uh, those uh, kind of ups and downs to manipulate our, our emotions as listeners. That's another way to think about the music. Remy, I, I mean, people say that jazz is, is, is quite improv it's quite, you know, made up. Yeah. yeah. The mm. words that we're speaking with right now, we're making them up. Like, I didn't plan to say this phrase that I'm saying right now, but it's it's understood, it's 
it's clear. So I think it's made up in the same way that I'm making up what I'm saying to you in this moment. Mm, mm. It's the same same process. Mm. But say, for example, if, if you went on stage with your brother, obviously people, like, if we're going to a different genre, like your Taylor Swift, your, your One Direction, all that stuff, they've obviously got songs that sure. they, they keep doing again and again and again. Is it creating something new or is it something that you already have pre-planned but you just sort of change it now and again? There are aspects of it that are the same. So, for example, we'll play the same songs and uh, the melodies, while they're uh, embellished in different ways each time, they're still the same still the same song and then i guess the improvised material it's it's new every time but people have their their phrases that they use their kind of character traits you know if you're hanging out with your best friend your best friend is going to have a certain attitude towards things you talk about or certain uh certain catchphrases that he might use even in language we have a lot of cliches uh or uh just phrases that we use over and over again, like, what's up? Like, what does that really even mean? It doesn't mean that much, but it, it means, like, how are you? You know what I mean? So I, I think with, with improvisation, there are certain certain things that each player does that you can expect them to do, or you can expect them to react in a certain way the more you play music with them. So it's 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 improvised, but it's, it's within limits. I sort of... Mm, I can sort of see where you're going with it, yeah. I'm just sort of interested in in, in a more sort of album sense because you you've got a few albums. We should mm-hmm. point out that you've got a few CDs out. How do you create an album based on the idea of an improv with limits? <laughs> Let's see. A lot of the material is planned, but you you kind of write space into the the music for improvisation. One person's part might be might be planned and another person kind of plays on top of that i mean it happens in pop music too if you listen to uh you know bill withers just the two of us grover washington is is the tenor saxophone player improvising a solo on top of what he's doing so that that's improvised that's made up on the spot but it's it's uh it's very appropriate to what's happening in that musical moment another another analogy you could think of like a basketball game there are all these rules to basketball and you have five people trying to uh, achieve a certain goal together and communicating with each other to to do this thing they're improvising but they're working within the limits of the game and that's another way to think about what five people on a stage are doing playing jazz obviously we know your inspirations but what sort of made you sort of go that way into jazz if that makes sense you mean how did i get into jazz in the first place pretty much well my brother and i when we were little kids, we played, we played music, we did theater stuff, we did dance stuff, we did voice acting as well. Um, it was one of the things that, that we did. And I think a lot of little kids, you know, they're growing up and they're, they're trying a bunch of different things, playing sports and doing whatever. So we, we went to this music camp one summer and learned some songs and we were, we were good, at, good at music and we enjoyed being good at something. <laughs> and so I think we just kind of kind of went from there we, we used to play for tips on the street in our hometown we just do that every weekend and uh just that kind of repetition and working on it consistently and learning new material and listening a lot it just became more and more a part of our lives i'm gonna throw something out to you i mean see okay. see see if you can catch it and throw it back to me with a good answer see i'm doing i'm doing jazz myself now i'll, I'll do my best <laughs> would you say if you're an actor, if you like yourself, you, you did a voiceover, do you think that the transition into something like jazz is quite easy given the fact that it is improv? Actually, now that you think about it, I think there is a correlation. The idea of performance, the idea of kind of curating an experience for a listener or working with another voice actor, as was the case with me and, and the character Ada on Zone of the Enders, uh, I mean, that's, that's all very, very similar and even the recording process, we were in a recording studio, the same place you would record music. And even growing up and, and learning learning how to be a voice actor, the um, kind of emphasis on technique and emphasis on listening, I would imitate all these different characters from TV. And uh, you do the same thing as a musician. You you learn from other musicians, you, you learn from recordings, and you imitate them. So uh, it's, it's a very similar process. I never thought about it that way. 
Mm. And then I'm going to explode your mind now, Remy. Please, I love it. I mm. love getting my mind exploded. Let's go. Because I'm going to nick, I'm going to nick this out of a documentary I saw regarding Avery Brooks. I don't know if you know who that is. He was um, Captain Cisco in Deep Space Nine. Basically, the idea is obviously he doesn't do all the Captain Eve stuff anymore. He is actually a, a musician. So, oh. yeah, interesting. So, one of the things that he says in the documentary, and I'm going to use it in our conversation because I think it does apply here, is that everybody in the world has a specific tune. Okay. Yeah. So, our tune sort of goes out into the universe. It may never be heard, but then half the time it is. So, my question is, is, is actually, in, in a sense, jazz, not sort of improv, but somebody's own song. Oh, okay. <laughs> I guess you could think about a, a song as containing a certain emotional character. And that's the way we oftentimes represent characters in cartoons or in opera or in movies. And uh, the idea that somebody has their song, a.k.a. maybe their identity, their character, their, their uh, view of their perspective, that's very nice. Mm. It's very poetic. Mm. If we want to go sort of back into gaming as well, I mean, stuff like mocap. People have always said that mocap is a sort of theatre because obviously you in a room, there's no sort of tables, you know, it's all blocks and they, they put dots on you and put you in spandex. But I would like to throw to the gaming developers now, is mocap just not jazz? Are you thinking about like movies like the character that plays Smeagol? in Lord of the Rings, like where they use that kind of technology. Mm. They're recording somebody improvising a part, I suppose. And I mean, I guess they do it with the, the physical actors as well. I mean, I guess jazz would be like dancing. If we're talking about human body in motion, it would be more like just going to the dance floor and expressing yourself within a certain style of dancing, as opposed to like a pre-choreographed ballet, maybe. I guess what I mean to say is like the process of jazz isn't so different from a lot of other things that we do. It's very similar to the way that we talk to each other. We improvise conversation, you know, and we use a language to express ourselves. And um, jazz has a kind of tradition and a vocabulary that we work with to express our thoughts. Mm. So. so here's the big sort of explosion in your mind, Remy, coming now. Okay. Is this podcast not jazz? Oh, what we're doing right now? Yeah, we got a little duet going right now. <laughs> if you look at it that way, so many things are jazz, um, if, if you want to take that that perspective on it. Do you think, oh, there's a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> to get back to the voice acting stuff, mm. I remembered a couple more things about the process of recording Zone of the Enders that you might be interested in. I remember meeting the creator of the game. He came out from, I think, Japan, and he was he was in the recording booth just listening in the whole time and giving me certain directions it was great to meet him, and, and I also remember being surprised. There are certain things in the script where you just have like a series of grunts. So it would be like, grunt, grunt, war cry. Or you just like, huh, 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 you know, stuff like that. And it was just funny to see it in the script after watching so many cartoons as a kid and uh, not, not really realizing that, oh, every little grunt and, and you know, cry in battle had to be recorded and edited in. I'm just thinking now, was it Hideo Kojima? Yes, I think that was him, yeah. Yeah, because obviously everyone will know him from obviously being part of Metal Gear. They gave me a game, like when it finally came out, I think they sent me a game in the mail, and in the game it had like a teaser for the next Metal Gear Solid. I seem to remember that. <laughs> Did they give you a free game? <laughs> they gave me a free game, but I didn't have the game system. <laughs> I grew up out in the woods. So, like, uh, I didn't have, at that time, I didn't have any neighbors that I could just, like, go over to their house and play games with. I didn't drive a car. I was just kind of uh, stuck in the woods. It was a great place to be stuck. I spent a lot of time just hiking and stuff like that as a kid. And I, yeah, just didn't have the, didn't have the game system. Do you still have it then, Remy, or? I still have it. You should have got him to sign it, Remy. Got the, the creator to sign it? Yeah. He showed up for the, uh. For the recording process, but once it came out, he was back in Japan. Fast forwarding to now, because we have to. Um, okay, let's go. Yeah, back back to now. Mm. <laughs> I'm going to share something with you, which is sort of a running joke in these podcasts. It has been, certainly, okay. for this year. I've just turned 30. 
Oh yeah, happy mm. birthday. This was about a couple of months ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but the interesting thing is, obviously, you're slightly older than I am. A couple of years. Yeah. So the running gag we've been having in these podcasts is, what advice would you give to somebody who is just turning 30? Oh, <laughs> I'd say um, the life that you want to live and the person that you want to be, now's your time to be that person. I think we spent a lot of our youth kind of looking towards the future of this kind of idea that you're going to become this this thing. It's like, nope, you're here. Now's the time to be who you who you want to be. So I guess that's my advice. Sort of like the first 29 years are a bit sort of jazzy, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> well, what isn't uh, after after this conversation? <laughs> um, no, but I, I guess, the, you know, the idea that we're always like kind of growing and learning and now it's time to do something with all that knowledge, you know? No more excuses. If there's one thing I'm good at, it's making excuses for myself. So I think uh, 30 is a, a good time to kind of move beyond that. Well, I'm going to give you a one-minute plug... Remy, one minute plug sure. for you to plug. It's only the end is the second runner, and anything else you've got coming up or being released. Definitely check out the game. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and uh, I'd say as as far as music, if you're curious about my music, my latest album is uh, with my band LaBeouf Brothers. We did a collaboration with Jack Quartet, and I had a song nominated for a Grammy this year in instrumental composition. Didn't get the Grammy, but it was it was a trip to be there. So you can check out my music by looking up uh, LaBeoufBrothers.com. If you're in New York and want to see a show, my next show is uh, at Smalls Jazz Club. It's November 14th at 10.30 p.m. I'll be there with my quintet. As a final note, because I, I like sure. saxophonists, and mm-hmm. people when they turn 30 think, hmm, I feel like learning a new instrument. Oh, yeah? Okay. How hard is it to learn how to... Play the saxophone. How to play the saxophone? Well, if you get like a decent instrument, it's just going to make everything easier. A lot of people like want to just get like the cheapest saxophone they can find, and it's just not going to it's not going to work. But if you get a working instrument of the woodwinds, it's one of the easier ones to learn. I'm thinking of learning how to do the violin. Oh, well, violin's tough. Yeah, I mean, I don't know much about violin. I've I've learned a little bit about the instrument because I write for violin a lot. But yeah, violin. I mean pitch is a little tough on that you can't just put down a button and the, the note will come out you gotta find the right spot on the finger fingerboard <laughs> but yeah go for it mm. i mean whatever instrument you choose i mean you gotta pick one that you like the sound of and and uh you know how hard or easy it is shouldn't be a factor you'll you'll enjoy the journey mm. <laughs> of getting better at something one of the things i did notice on your website which is your own website is the fact you you provide cheap music that's right yeah I'm 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 a composer as well. I write a lot of my own music. I don't think I've ever actually seen a musician just freely give sheet music. I mean, I think it's it's maybe a little more common in in uh, the jazz composer world or classical composers. They'll they'll provide um, sheet music for for institutions to purchase. So, like if for example, Keio University in Tokyo, they wanted to perform some of my music they have to purchase the sheet music and um i have my own publishing company so i just sell it on my website yeah it's it's a uh, it's a lot of uh uh fun writing music and hearing uh, people play it well remy it's been a pleasure interview and a very interesting uh conversation oh yeah it's been great to talk to you thank you so much for reaching out to me yeah obviously keep up with the jazz oh thank you <laughs> <laughs> and uh i hope that movie comes out thanks very much for your time remy <laughs> All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.